get into the message. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Because this is a message, okay? And I'm looking at the time, so I need to get there. Jesus, thank you so much for who you are. Father, uh, it's been good. It's been very good to be a part of the Lanson Church of the Nazarene. Even though we feel like we have a connection from many, 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 many years ago, uh, which we do, uh, you have given us a, a, a different connection now uh, and, and quite a bit of love for the people, given us all, uh, a whole new understanding of how to pray for a Lanson. Thank you for that. We want you to put your hand on Pastor Carr and Lucy. Uh, we know as, as they make their transition, they've been doing a lot of transitioning here the last couple years. Um, uh, we joke, we joke uh, uh, to Pastor Carr about how many times he's going to retire, and then he says he's not going to retire, and then he says this is it. And, you know, poor guy. I ask, Lord Jesus, that you just work with him. And then when he comes in here, and Lucy, they, were, they already know they're loved, that you would just kind of do something in the way of leadership that would keep us moving forward on being that body of Christ and being that holy priesthood to our neighbors, to our friends, to our frenemies, to our family members. Help us to be that, Lord God, because we don't want to lose our purpose here. And Father, fill this church to overflowing, not just on Easter, which sometimes is that's where we, where we pray a lot during this uh, season, but, but from, from the day after, from the Sunday after, uh, uh, do something with the food pantry and the clothes. Uh, do something here in the community uh, that revival would start. And the revival would start right here, Lord God. We, we need that freshness. And it's already going on. But we need to, we need to see the transformed hearts, what, the, what takes place. Lord, we love you. We want you to speak today. Speak into our hearts. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. You are my rock and my redeemer. I will trust you today to help me to know what to say and how to say it. You're just a wonderful, wonderful Lord. We pray all this in your name. Amen. 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 Now, let's... Um, let me kind of give you a little bit of a background and, and a little bit of a transition where, where, we're, where we are at with, um, uh, with this passage, okay? The transition um, is going now back to Ezekiel chapter 37. We've, uh, we've looked at three Hebrew words that spoke to life and breath, um, wind. Um, uh, it's, it starts at our base level and then just kind of moves its way up. It moves its way up into our personality and into our mind. Uh, that uh, at Neshama is what God breathed into us. And that's what makes us different than a tree and than an animal. Uh, and, he, and he breathed this life, this breath of life into us. And we're going to deal with this word life, though. And so at the tail end of uh, Ephesians chapter 37, that passage that we read, verse 10, at the tail end of that valley of dry bones, the, 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 the bones were all dressed now with, with muscles, tendons, and flesh, and they're just laying there. God says to Ezekiel, prophesy to the four winds, to the four corners, prophesy to those four winds. Tell them to come through and sweep through and tell them to breathe life into them. That word life, okay, it's attached with this. We also see this word life in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. When God breathed into the nostrils of Adam, man, that's the Hebrew word, uh, Adam, uh, it's the Hebrew word. That's where we get the name Adam. He wasn't named Adam, and Adam is man. Uh, and so that's, that's where that came from. And so they breathed, and it was a breath of life that came in. Now, Hebrew and Greek are two different languages, but they share in similarities, just like we would have, like, like we would have with languages as well. Okay, pero. Pero in Spanish is dog. We get that, right? So if I said Chihuahua in uh, Spanish or Mexican in Spanish, if I said Chihuahua, the translation would be Taco Bell in English, right? No, 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 no. I'm kidding you. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding you. Okay. 
Paco Bell? <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding you. However, I do want to say, you guys remember that cute little dog, cute, cute little chihuahua with Taco Bell? It, it was a great, I, you know, uh, you know uh, just, I can't even think of half the thing he says. I've, I've got four of them buried in, a, buried in a tote someplace that I'm saving to, for eBay one of these days. Uh, and then, um, that, because they, you squeeze them and they say different things that he said on the commercials. But do you guys realize that when that dog was the mascot for Taco Bell, that their sales plummeted, kept going down and down and down? And I thought those were some of the best commercials out there. They, kind of like what we would have with the Geico commercials now, right? And it just kept going down and down and down. But they had to take the dog out. A little too close. Chihuahua in Spanish is Taco Bell in English. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Okay. But anyway, that's just, just some marketing things. You know, don't ever use a chihuahua uh, for, your, for your Mexican food. Uh, anyway, so we have this life going on. So as the word life in the Hebrew translates to life in the Greek, we have a match. And the match is when Jesus said to Martha in, uh, in uh, John chapter 11, Verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Same word that was used in the Hebrew. Again, these are, these are companion words, I guess you would say, right? Companion words. And, and so it connects, but it connects in the Hebrew. So the word life is used multiple times in, in, various, in various fashions. It's a very popular word in the Hebrew, just as it is in the Greek. And so it does match life in the Hebrew and life in the Greek. And so when God breathed life into these, into these bones, into those bodies, and upraised a great, a greatly, exceedingly great army, he brought about revival. And so I think there's a connection when he says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will not see death, even though he may be there, but will live. Whoa, those are good. Those are good things. So we don't want to lose track of that. And that's the connection here with this passage. Now, let me paint you a little bit of a backdrop of what's going on. This is Palm Sunday, and Palm Sunday, we, we celebrate Jesus coming into Jerusalem. Where does he come from? He comes from Bethany. This is chapter, John chapter 12. Uh, you, can, you can stay close. You know, John, you've got John chapter 11 up there, but John chapter 12. Um, uh, Jesus is now coming from Bethany, from the home of Martha and, and her sister. Now, I don't know why they don't name, name Mary, but Martha and her sister and Lazarus. He's alive. So Jesus stops back in after, after a time of being away uh, from Lazarus' resurrection. He stops back in and uh, has dinner with them. And then the next day goes off and has this triumphal entry into Jerusalem. What is going on? So the backdrop is this. Everything that Palm Sunday was all about to us, everything that the triumphal entry with Jesus coming into Jerusalem and all the fanfare that was going on and all the attention that he received, the cloaks that came off and the palm branches that went down. So Jesus could come in on this unbridled colt as king. Son of David, Hosanna, Hosanna, right? They were bringing in the king. They were excited. But it all started because of Lazarus. Jesus is now moving into ministry. So this is kind of where we're at. Jesus is going through ministry. Things are getting more and more tense now. The Pharisees have been plotting now for a couple years to get rid of him. And they're looking for this time to get rid of him. 
Oh, they're looking for the time to get rid of him during Passover because they feel like he's probably going to be in Jerusalem for that Passover. So they are, they are very anxious to get rid of Jesus. So he comes along, and he comes up to this Lazarus situation. Lazarus resurrects from the dead. Then Jesus disappears for almost a month and a half. He disappears. You've heard of the story of Nicodemus, right? Nicodemus was that short guy who climbed up into a tree. Okay. Uh, um, Zacchaeus, Nicodemus. Come on, Nicodemus. Gee whiz. Somebody ought to read their Bible. Anyway, thank you. Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus climbs up. That wee little man was he, right? Zacchaeus climbs up, climbs up in the tree, and all that was taking place when Jesus went out into the wilderness and around the Ephraim area. So he escaped Bethany, but he left Lazarus there. Jesus caused this commotion because he wanted the people to see something. This is, this is interesting. This is really interesting. The time now has come to an end, but it actually started not the week before, but it actually started six weeks before that. When he raised Lazarus from the dead. Now we come into the story just a little bit closer. Jesus is at a town not too far away, but he's at, a, he's, at a, he's at another town. They come up to him and they say, Lord, Lazarus, and we know you, how much you like this family. He did. He really did like Mary and Martha. Uh, in fact, made a little illustrative, a, a, a illustration of Mary and Martha, right? You know, Martha, the busy one. Martha, you need to choose the more important thing. And that was what Mary was doing. Mary was, Mary was already at his feet listening to him. So, and so this was a wonderful family. So there's a lot of questions here. I'll bring up those questions in a minute, you know, I, 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 you know about, about the family. But Jesus, Jesus loved this family. Your friend, Lazarus, is dying. In other words, come on, Lord. <laughs> come on, your friend, he's dying. Okay, that's pretty much all he said. Okay. Disciples were a little bit confused because they knew of the depth of his love for this family. And he said, okay. He waited until Lazarus died. Now, I am convinced that throughout Jesus' ministry, that it was one step at a time that Jesus took one step and he listened, took another step and he listened. Turn left, he turned left. Turn right, he turned right. But he did it kind of like one step at a time. But now as he gets to Lazarus, this is like a chessboard. And he's moving the pieces in the right place so you can call checkmate. This is phenomenal. I mean, this is all now coming together, and it all started with Lazarus. Lazarus dies. Jesus says, I know, he's asleep. No, well, good, his disciples said. Good, if he sleeps, he'll get better. <laughs> oh, no, no, okay, come on, guys. And, you know, and then Thomas, you know, and say, hey, we need to go with him. Because if he dies there, we're going to die with him. Okay, well, they're getting closer to Jerusalem. In other words, you want to stay away from Jerusalem at this point. And, uh, and so he ends up, he shows up at Bethany. The crowd was already there. Martha meets him at the distance. He said, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. I know. I know. Do you believe in the resurrection? Yeah, I believe in the resurrection. I am the resurrection of life. Do you get it, Martha? No, Martha's not getting it very well. But she sends word back to Mary. And then Mary shows up. And this is where I want to pick up the passage. Verse 33 begins this way. When Jesus saw Mary weeping and the Jews who came along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. 
can only imagine how troubled he was. Just wait until we get into those word meetings. He was deeply moved and troubled. Where is Lazarus? He asked. Come and see, Lord. They replied. Jesus wept. One of the shortest verses in the English Bible. Yeah. Not in the Greek, though. It's three words in the Greek. Jesus wept. What a picture. Can we just stop there and just kind of take that in for a little bit? We know that he cares, but Jesus wept. What is, what is going on here? Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, <laughs> But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man. By this time, there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. I don't quote the King James too much, but I'm going to quote the King James here just because it's cool. And it's more accurate to the Greek, just a little bit old English. Basically what she said, by this time, he stinketh. Okay? There is your King James for the day. Okay? So let me get back. By this time, there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you? That if you believe, you will see the glory of God. Wow, boy, this passage is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So, they moved. They took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up. And said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here. That they may believe that you sent me. After he said this. Jesus called in a loud Jesus called in a loud voice Lazarus come out we'll, we'll give you a come forth too but Lazarus come out the dead man came out <laughs> his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Whoa, something's happening here. Now, Jesus may not have been divine because he was raised from the dead, because Lazarus was raised from the, uh, raised from the dead. And there were a couple other people. Tabitha was, was raised from the dead. Um, and, and stuff like so so there were some things going on Paul had uh, Paul raised somebody from the dead that fell out of the window right because um, he preached too long whoops <laughs> just waiting for somebody to tip out of their chair yeah lost another one today <laughs> and we and those Baptists beat us to the buffet and we just lost another one um, but here just look what's going on Lazarus comes out 
He doesn't come out like a zombie. He doesn't come out like a mummy. He comes out. He is now resurrected. He looks, he looks around. He looks around and says, dude, what died here? <laughs> and the dude looks over and he says, you did. <laughs> so what's that smell? That's me. And he, he comes out that he is alive. But there's something going on with Jesus. There's something so much larger that's going on here. And Jesus is deeply troubled. And I want to talk to you about that deeply troubled. He uh, deeply, uh, deeply moved in spirit and troubled himself. There's the word himself is there. He, he was troubled inside himself is kind of where we're getting with that. This word is used just a handful of times in the New Testament. It's not used very often at all. And it's always used in a negative, this, this deeply moved in spirit. It's always used in the negative. When Jesus, remember Jesus healed a couple people, and when he healed them, he said, whatever you do, do not tell anybody. And you see the word sometimes sternly. He said sternly to them, do not tell anybody. It was early on in his ministry, do not tell anybody. It's the same word that was used there. It's almost as if, okay, and this is where the word comes from, that there is a snort like a, a, an animal or a horse is snorting because the, the, the animal is angry, is upset uh, about something, irritated with something. And Jesus, now, now we're seeing this deeply moved in spirit. Can you see the question marks that are coming in my head? We, we have this deeply moved in spirit, but we know the context that Jesus is not angry. Is he indignant? Because the word can draw from being indignant as well. Or stern. What is going on? He is deeply. We know in the context how much he loved. When he wept, he wept. It was a Greek. Okay. He wept. He was troubled. He saw, he saw Mary. He loved Martha, busy as she was. He loved Mary. He, and, and, and Mary, in, in um, um, John chapter 12, Mary is the same person that, that actually anoints Jesus' feet uh, with, with um, um, uh, what was it, nard, uh, and, then, and then wipes it off with her hair. Uh, when he was having his his dinner there right before right before the triumphal entry, uh, John even points that out in chapter eleven just just to let us know that's coming up. But why is Jesus? And then this word troubled. Jesus even said, "Do not be troubled. Do not be in distress." He said that on several occasions. Did you know that this word troubled also came up? When he was pronouncing with Judas that he was going to betray him at the Last Supper, go off and do what you need to do. He was troubled. He was troubled inside. He troubled himself inside. And he was so troubled in spirit. Now, we get that one. We get why he could be troubled. But why would he be deeply moved or groaning as, as some translations have done? Why was he groaning inside? And the only thing I can put my finger on is he knew what was coming. It could have been the fact that he was so moved by the fact that he had to let Lazarus die. He knew the plan, but the plan included suffering. And the people that he loved the most, he was going to have to let them suffer so that they could get to the place where they would believe that he was God, the son of God, and that the father sent him. It, it, it's, it's there in the passage as well. What is going on? It, it, it was he, it, it, this comes up again. It even come as he moves to the tomb. Was it because he was moving to the tomb? I think it's because he was moving towards the tomb that he was deeply moved once more. 
Because in order for people to believe in him, the suffering had to take place. In order for people to believe in him, in order for the sins of man to be forgiven and wiped away clean, Jesus had to die on that cross and shed the blood because there is no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. I don't know. Is it all just now coming down on him? Is he just now starting to feel? Remember in Luke, when he was, when he was praying that last prayer, you know, at the, at, in, the Garden of, uh, in the Garden of Olives, Mount, Mount Olive, right? He is praying up there. And, and Luke reports that he is praying so intently that we see blood droplets come off a of sweat. You know, and that shows that somebody is in a much stress. At least that's what I've read. And, and so is this all kind of coming down? Jesus is a part of this chessboard and he sees what's going on. He's been hiding out. He's been walking through crowds and not being touched. He disappears kind of, you know, he, he moves and he disappears. The Pharisees were not able to get their hands on him whatsoever. And now he is surrendering himself and he's six weeks out, seven weeks or so. You know, he's, he's, at one, he's at one to two months out of all this taking place. And here he is. All this is now on him. And I cannot help but think that there was so much on him. Jesus was not only fully God, but he was also fully man. And that's why it is so important when we read Hebrews and find out that he was able to sympathize with us, yet was without sin. Yet he didn't sin, right? But he was able to sympathize with us because he was fully man. He understood what was going on and he understood the pressures of this even more than anything else. And instead of one step over here and one step over there and listening, he knows the big picture is coming, coming to fruition. And it is now coming. And I think that time in the wilderness, that time in Ephraim, when he, had to, when, when he was there, he was doing all sorts of neat things during that time frame before he came back to Bethany. He comes back to Bethany. Now they're after Lazarus' head. They have to get rid of the testimony of the dead man who came back to life. So they're going after Lazarus too. He knew that he was putting, he, here Lazarus was asleep. He, he is there with his eternity. And he pulled him back from that and put him back in this suffering world. And now not only is his life at stake, but Mary and Martha's life is at stake. We don't know what's going on with Lazarus. We don't know how old he was. We know he was a man. That's all we got. And we don't know his age. We don't know why he wasn't married. Was he married and lost his wife? What happened? Why are they living together? Was he the younger brother? Where does he fit in this particular passage? Some people think that he was the younger brother. I haven't, I haven't read anything, done a lot of studying on that, so I'm not for sure. So, so here he is. Where does he fit in all this? But Jesus pulls him back from his eternity and puts him back in this suffering world. Do you not think that's going through his mind as well? Completely and utterly overwhelmed by what's going on. Now Lazarus, they want to shut him up. Because he is a living testimony of what happened. And people were coming to Jesus in droves because of Lazarus' testimony. Jesus knew the pieces. And he knew that he had to do it just right. Follow me. This is almost like a politician positioning himself and, and, and manipulating things to, to get to where they're going to go, right? He, what he's doing here is he's setting up the crowd. There has now been six plus weeks that people are all ramped up of Lazarus' testimony. Jesus is building up the crowd. 
so that he could walk through and they could see that the father had sent him. Did you, did you not, did you not understand? Did I not tell you that if you believe that you will see the glory of God and that's what all this was about. He was building up this moment so he could enter into Jerusalem where he would eventually be arrested and crucified. And it all went back on Lazarus. Jesus is standing before that tomb. Father, I thank you. The reason I'm saying all of this, Lord, is because I want the people to hear <laughs> so that they can believe. Lazarus, he didn't whisper it. Lazarus, come out. Can you imagine that crowd? And it was a great crowd already. They must have been a popular family, or at least a large family. There was a lot of people already there. And here he comes right out of that tomb. He didn't know where he was going, and he was probably tightly wound up. He really was. But loose enough that he was able to come. He wasn't walking full step. May have been a little groggy. Don't know. And he comes out. And Jesus says some very powerful words. Take off those grave clothes, right? And let him go. I wonder when Jesus said that, if he was processing a resurrection that he was going to experience a couple months away from that. I don't know. But I do know what it means to us today. Because there's a tomb that we've buried some stuff. We've buried it in our heart. We may have some eternal struggles as well. Internal groanings. Very passionate. By the way, you know, just, just keep doing some reading. With it well within context, deeply moved is well within context, right? We get that. But the history of that word is very, very interesting to me. And so here he is, and here we are, with a heart that is filled with a lot of dry bones, dead stuff. It's been there for a long time. <clears throat> God said to Ezekiel, speak to those winds. They will breathe life into those dry bones, into those dead people, into those dead things. And he will give you life. And when he gives you that life, he will change things. It does not mean that it's going to be that bed of roses but people will definitely see the glory of God. Amen? When they see that your heart has its own empty tomb because Jesus has come in and taken what was dead and brought life to it. I have come that they may have life and have that life abundantly. Life upon life, okay? have that life abundantly. We don't know what's in front of us. We don't know if it's going to be some suffering, but God's glory is going to be there. And when that revival comes because he resurrects that dead stuff out of that tomb in our heart, 
people will see and know God and be transformed. And that is the essence of revival. That's the essence of revival for us. And that's the essence of revival for the church. That people's lives are transformed. Not patted on the back. Oh, you were born this way. Bless your heart. You're loved by Jesus and loved by us. But you stink because you're dead. Take off the grave clothes and let them go. Oh, there's so much. Oh, there's so much here. Okay? Okay, everybody's still in their seat. That's good. No one's tipped over. That's even better. Okay? Don't have to do a resurrection service right now, but God's good. What's that? How long did Ezekiel go after Christ brought him back from death? Oh, uh, Lazarus? I have no I, I don't know if he had a full life or what. Yeah, they, there's... there's we, they were looking to kill him. So. They were. They were looking to kill him. Though we don't have any record that he was martyred. So, you know, I, I think probably God, you know, protected as well. But they were, they were being sought after. And if you don't think that that didn't include Mary and Martha too, right? Well, once you're brought back by God, I know. you should be good to go. Yeah, you, <laughs> you should be. You should be. <laughs> but process some of that. I, again, this was very complicated. It's not just a simple story of Lazarus being called out. But process it in a way that you have a tomb, your heart, and sometimes it's filled with dead stuff. Even though we may have aged well with Jesus, okay, we've aged well, but we've let some things go and they've, they've, they've become dead. Well, he, those of us that have aged well, we still need revival. We still need life, which comes from Christ and Christ alone. The word, the word um, uh, za, uh, za, uh, za, zao, zao is the, is the, um, um, is the verb. And then the zoe, you guys have heard zoe. Zoe is the word, a Greek word for life. So you've heard Zoe because it's been used in a lot of Christian ministries and stuff. But Zoe means life. Um, that's the, that would be the noun form, adverb form of that. Anyway, so this Zoe, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly because Jesus breathed into us and we were transformed. Okay? Now, between now and Easter, between now and Good Friday, bring somebody Good Friday. Yeah, they think the church is strange. Boy, Good Friday is going to make them think it's really strange, okay? Yeah, but we're going we're gonna to reflect, and let's let this Easter be a time of revival, of a real resurrection, of a real resurrection of who we are in him. Would you stand with me, please? Lord, I, I can't say it's my gift, Sometimes it's the plight. You have given me a message and I've jumped right in the center of it and stirred it all up. We have at least 192 different thoughts that the Holy Spirit may be poking us on. And I don't know where it's going to land, Lord Jesus. But as a culmination, we want revival. Lord God, if we have folks here today that need repentance, let them find you through repentance. Let them find their forgiveness. Help them to turn and be transformed. Because no longer are we the old, but you have come in to give the new. Father, some of us have been with you quite a while. But... We stinketh a little bit. We need you to take that dead and make it alive again. We do not care the earthly consequences of that. We do not. We want glory to be given to you and people to find transformation and life and life abundantly. So, Father God, we are willing. We surrender that. Some of us need repentance, Lord God. Some of us need surrender. But all of us, Lord Jesus, need you. 
Father, once a year, we focus and celebrate on your death and resurrection, and that's what this Holy Week is going to be all about, and we're, we're purposely going to be doing that. Just a reminder. But Father, every day, we celebrate your Son as resurrected because he lives in us. He does. He lives in us. But we want other people to find that out as well. We need to love and love beyond and present a Jesus who loves even more so that that Jesus can come in and transform. Lord God, we are yours this day. We are hanging on to you. We love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and we love you with all of our strength. Give us this day a bit of a daily bread that we can give to others who desperately need that nourishment much more than we do because we've had you for so many years. We love you, Lord. Care for us. And let us have a good week of letting people know about you. Fill these services, Lord Jesus, the next couple days with those that are very needy of you. Bring people across our path this week that we can tell, not just about a service, but we can tell about you. Jesus, we're excited. We can't wait to see what you're going to do for the Alanson Church of the Nazarene family. The Alanson community, Pelston, Harbor Springs, Petoskey, Indian River, Afton, you name it, Lord God. Whatever's close, Conway, Odin, Jesus, we want to see revival and begin it with me. In your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Thank you so much for your patience.